Ladies and gentlemen, the Dow Foundation and Dow Family have endeavored to concentrate on the most important problem we consider in Pakistan. If we want to grow our country, if we want to develop, if we want to become one of the most important nations within the community of nations, it is absolutely imperative that we develop our talent, our people. And this is what this school is all about. Developing talent. Developing leadership. It's absolutely imperative that all of us, in our every waking moment, realize the importance of this. And to give you a few statistics, you know we have 10,000 births a day. That's 400 an hour. Can you imagine trying to set up a school for 400 students every hour? Those are the challenges that we have to face. We were spending here one hour, we should have built a school for 400 students. No country in the world can afford to do that, or has the resources to be able to keep up with that pace. So we've got to work together. We've got to work in a way in which we can apply our knowledge, our experience, our education, our background, our commitments, our opportunity to try to, come, uh, to help others and to develop our human resources within, within Pakistan. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a lifelong commitment and I urge and encourage every one of you to commit to that. Tell me, once again, what a privilege it is to have you here down there. It would be my pleasure to invite you to come and deliver the talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hussein, uh, again, for inviting me to be here and uh, instigating me to be in Pakistan. I just want to say I've been here for two days. I think it's been literally some of the most intense two days I've had in my McKinsey career, which is saying something. I thought Korea worked hard, but I have decided that one day here is worth a week in other places in terms of how people work. But it's been, it's been an amazing two days of, uh, of, of meeting phenomenal leaders. And, uh, and I have come away already uh, extremely excited about the opportunities uh, that are here. Uh, and we'll be doing my best to try and portray that in other parts of the world with investors, with consumers, and others um, around the place. Uh, I also just want to say uh, it's inspiring to hear again about your commitment to education. I think it is the fundamental issue. But the Japanese have a saying that if you want to get to the root cause of a problem, you ask why five times. I mean, why does this happen and why does it end? In my view, when you ask the five whys on most issues, in fact, I think all issues that are out there, including political tensions, including income inequality, uh, I, I actually think it boils down to education. Education is the fundamental issue that we need to all work on. So when leaders uh, commit themselves the way you do, I think it inspires all of us uh, in where you are and what we need to do. So over uh, the next 30 minutes or so, um, I won't put you to sleep, but I'm going to try and take you through a, a quick sort of Cook's tour of what we think some of the biggest forces are that are affecting the world, uh, what are the implications of those forces on business, and then what are the implications of those implications on business on leadership. And um, I wanted to put uh, a motif in here, which is where Pakistan is, and I think you know that, but I think the rest of the world needs to understand that, which is the very central position in which Pakistan sits uh, in the world. What I'd argue is the new world, because the new world is moving east uh, from, from the west. And you are extraordinarily well positioned, I think, to deal with these forces that are at work, which are, we would say are like gravity. So I just, let's not forget the strategic positioning. The Silk Road, of which I'm a huge fan of where that's going to be, that was the single largest trading route on Earth uh, for well over 1,200 years. 
uh, it is the fastest growing trade group on earth today. Not the largest, but it's the fastest growing. Uh, if you think about what's happening in Africa, what's going to be happening uh, in the Middle East, what's happening in South Asia and with China, you are extraordinarily well, uh, well positioned. So I'm, I'm going to go through these three sections with that in mind about where our positioning is for a country of significance uh, with these forces at work. So let me start first with, uh, with the forces at work. It's very easy, um, I find, to get distracted by what's happening in the markets on a day to day or even over a period of years, the volatility that's going on. And what we've tried to do is step back a bit and say, what are some of the more fundamental long-term forces that are there? And I would argue, you can criticize me, I, I would argue that the forces I'm going to talk about are more like gravity than ephemeral forces that will come and go depending on what happens. They're relentless forces that we all need to take into account. Um, and there are four of them. I'm going to spend more time on the first two, which is the the rise or re-rise of the emerging markets. I mean, we are here in, in I think, one of the most attractive markets. I'm going to talk a bit about why I say that. We're going to talk about the power of disruptive technologies. It's my view that we are in the early chapters of a 100-chapter book on technology revolution. We've seen a lot of change, but we ain't seen nothing yet. I'm going to talk about some of those changes that are underway. There's an aging of the world that is going on. Well, while this country is, in my view, fortunate to be a very young country, uh, unfortunately, for most of the rest of the world, we're getting a lot older. And that has, that has a lot of implications on productivity growth for countries on health care costs and so forth. As I always say, though, as, as I get older, I tend to think it's a good thing that we have more older people, but older people cost a lot, too, if we're not, if we don't think about it. So there's going to be a desire for places where there are a lot of young people. And we are a more integrating world, especially now with data and human flows as opposed to the typical trade and capital flow. So those are the, the four forces uh, that I'm going to quickly bang through. The first thing I just want to say is if you look at a 2,000 year time frame you, and you were able to balance uh, a piece of paper and say that was the earth, made the earth flat, where would the natural balance point be where you'd have an you know, equal side on, on the left and the right? And in the uh, year zero, it was roughly you know, near Afghanistan. Uh, that was where the center was. There was obviously a very strong uh, Chinese economy and actually uh, Indian uh, economy was there or that, or that in its region. If you look over a basically a 2,000 year period, it gradually moved left and we ended up in 1950 roughly in Iceland, right? That's where you had, that's where the center moved. And basically what this chart's trying to say is in a 75 year period, we're going to go back to where we were uh, nearly 2,000 years ago and it's the the weight of the world is going to be where it was at that particular time, 2,000 years ago, where, where the Silk Road and so forth was important. But the key thing here is the speed with which you're moving back. We haven't seen that. What, what's the reason for that? We would argue that it's urbanization. Uh, urbanization is a gravitational force. And if you look at what's happening in, in well over 800 cities around the world today, we are seeing a relentless move of people from rural areas to cities. In China, it's about 20 million people a year that are moving from rural areas to cities. And those people move irrespective of policies that are in place. In China, I was there when SARS uh, was there. which was a very serious uh, in endemic that had to be dealt with. There were 22 million people that moved in that year. During the H1N1 virus, 25 million people moved during that year. During the great financial crisis, 24 million people moved through the process. When the Communist Party said, we don't want any more people to be moving from rural areas to cities, 23 million people moved. It's relentless. And China is only 54% urbanized. This, this game is only near the halfway point, if you will, in that economy. And what happens when people move from rural areas to cities, typically, is they become middle class, right? There is, a, you, there is a lot of work that's been done 
on the role that cities play in moving people up the chain. You can, that doesn't mean to say there aren't slums and favelas and so forth, favelas, but, but what you see for the bulk of the population is it's a conveyor belt into the middle class. And if we look forward over the next 15 years, we're gonna see 2.2 billion people entering the middle class, largely driven through urbanization. And I say that because in a time when there's a lot of concern about demand growth and commodity prices being at a very low level, we have to step back and look at what demand is going to be as we move forward. And that number, 2.2 billion, is about a thousand times larger than the Industrial Revolution, right, where, we, where there was a very significant change uh, on the planet in terms of GDP growth. So this is a historically an unprecedented level of growth. It's the size and the speed with which people are moving through the system that we're going to have to deal with. And again, that makes me very optimistic. We obviously have to educate people and ensure there's enough jobs and so forth. But those people that want to consume, and what we say middle class, these are people with $7,000 of disposable income. This is not a New York middle class or a German middle class. This is $7,000 disposable income. The demand for goods, services, agricultural products, and so forth is, is going to be very significant. Um, and this is something that I think we have to keep in mind while we're going through a, the downside of, a, of the commodity super cycle. So that's the first thing I just want to say. We think it's very important to look at cities. Cities is actually where we think a lot of the action is. And as I said, we think that the, the bulk of that is going to be happening in Asia, including in Pakistan. Uh, th this is where we're going to see the growth that's actually occurring. We do work for many of our clients where we will literally say, whatever your products and services are, we have a database of about 4,000 cities. Which are the top cities that you should be focused on? And that, if you look at it, let's say you're Procter & Gamble, the number one place that you need to be right now is in Lagos, in Nigeria. I mentioned there are more babies born in Nigeria this year than all of Europe uh, combined. So you may be nervous about Nigeria and the Boko Haram and how things are working, but if you want to be a relevant global company over the next five to ten years, you better be in Nigeria. And I would argue we're going to see similar arguments with respect to Pakistan. With the size of this population and with the movement, and I know there's a lot of things that need to be done, this is going to be a place of relevance if you want to be a global uh, institution. But it's important, again, to look at where uh, the opportunities uh, are. Um, the, the, so, so I could go on a bit. I'm going to stop it for there just on this demographic this, uh, urbanization shift that's going on. The only thing, if you only remember one thing from what I'm saying, please just remember the 2.2 billion middle class consumers. The, the other comment I just want to make on it before switching to technology is when those 2.0 billion middle class consumers want to eat and live like middle class consumers in other places of the world, that's going to have a pretty significant impact on commodity prices. So I don't know what oil prices are going to do. I have no clue. But I will tell you, I do not believe they're going to be anywhere down at the level they are now when you see what that demand is going to do. And so for copper, basic minerals, uh, the agriculture and food, which I think is going to be an incredibly exciting business uh, in the future. We have to look at what's going to be happening. And, and if you're a user of those commodities, you need to prepare yourself now because we're going to start to get headwinds on that side. If you're a producer of those, you need to think strategically about how you position yourself. And again, in ag food, which I think is a very big opportunity in this country, there are going to be huge opportunities for companies uh, to be able to build themselves. Again, we think that there is going to be a need for about 80 Nestle sized companies to be built in South Asia over the next 15 years just to meet the demand. That's the kind of the scale of what we're, we're looking at. If we now go to technology, I mentioned we think we're in the early chapter of a 100 chapter book on technology. There are 12 disruptive technologies that we think are going to have a very significant impact on the world. I'm not going to go through each one of them. We know about the mobile internet. The best example of mobile internet for me 
in mobile commerce is Alibaba in, in China. What they have done is fundamentally change the equation, actually for SMEs. They've allowed many millions of small Chinese companies, many of them mom and pops, to join a global system. They're also, through mobile commerce, disrupting the banking system. You know, Alibaba actually gives loans between $10,000 uh, uh, and as low as $100 to people. And they believe they can do it better than banks because they have more data. They know how often you wash your hair, how many children you have, when, when you, you know, what stores you go to and what you buy. And by the way, if you don't pay them, they'll just shut you off the system, which is a tougher thing than anyone else can provide. But that, I think in China, we really see that the U.S. is behind China on that side, though it's, it's moving. Automation of knowledge work, we, we predict that 40 percent of the work that, the, that, that a typical worker does in a corporation will be automated uh, in the next 10 years. And that, a lot of these lessons, by the way, apply to McKinsey. We love to tell other people what to do. A lot of these things will hit us very hard. So I worry about machines replacing uh, what we do in many regards. And it doesn't mean we fight it. We better just understand it to know what it is we're going to add value onto the, onto the machine. I'm not going to go through all of these different pieces, but this technological disruption, I think, is something that everyone, not just business, but government, NGOs, educational institutes, uh, have to factor in. It basically now affects every single part of our lives. This is just a, a picture of you know, someone going from their house to the workplace. Literally every single activity that you do, there is a disruptor that is now there to try and try and make that service better, cheaper, faster, more pleasant uh, as, as you move ahead. And it's literally in every element of, uh, of, of what we do. Uh, the, the big drivers of this technological shift, we think, are three. One is, is computing power, just the power, this is Moore's law, uh, but the ability uh, of machines to actually process uh, information and deal with highly complex analytical problems in a short period of time is escalating. Um, we believe that, and this is really from Singularity University in California, uh, the John Chambers at Cisco will argue it'll happen five years earlier, but that, that we will be able to get a machine that can actually mimic a human brain uh, by 2023. And that's actually, that's going to have profound implications, I think, on work and on many aspects of what we do. I'm, again, optimistic, but we need to think about that. Uh, the second is, is around connectedness and, and intelligence. There are 4.2 billion people that are now connected uh, in the world. And this is just going to continue to escalate. Uh, the telecom companies have played a very big role in doing that. Uh, but it's, it's the technology that's actually enabling people to be able to connect and communicate and wire themselves up. I think will have very profound implications for education. And then data. Uh, we have been applying more sensors to more, pe more than people uh, for about the last uh, eight to nine years, right? So more, there's more connectedness in the Internet of Things than there are with humans. And with that, we're collecting a lot of data and information. And with the computing power that's there, we're able to store much more real-time data than we ever have before. Every two days as a human race, we collect more data than we have in our previous 2,000 years combined. That's happening every two days. It's the last 2,000. So think about the escalation of that as we move ahead. It's a, it's a mammoth amount of it. Unfortunately, 5% of that data is useful. 95% of it's useless right now. But if you are able to mine that data effectively, you can, you can generate all sorts of insights with the massive computer power that you now have. And we think using the data that we have today with the computer power that we have today, that a company that uses it well can see an 8 to 9% productivity improvement per year just from what we do today. So this is something that uh, is here, we think, to stay and is going to accelerate uh, as we move ahead. One of the ways I look at computing power is, again, trying to relate it not on Moore's Law, which is obviously a, a, a well-known and, and understood piece, but more on what a, what a computer can actually do. And we are today at the level of a mouse brain, which I don't want to say is to underestimate how complex a mouse brain 
actually is. That's a big uh, achievement. But again, as I mentioned, you know, by 2023, getting to a human brain, and some are even predicting, could you even get to all human brains? I, I have no clue. That's a way out there from my point of view. But I think we have to be thinking about this force because it's not, th this, this innovation is not driven by government. There wasn't a prime minister that said we should be here or a CEO that said we should be here. It's innovators uh, that are out there developing this and we think it will, uh, it will, it will continue. I mentioned that on, on the devices that we've actually passed uh, the case where now we have more devices that are connected than humans that will continue um, as, we, as we move through, uh, uh, through time. And this is going to have a lot of, of implications on orthodoxies that we typically hold. So the idea I was taught in, in my business school training that you had to own assets to be able to leverage their value. Well, that doesn't quite equate for the people that developed Airbnb or Uber and so forth. I'm going to use other people's resources uh, to be able to, to create value. That just wasn't taught. Uh, marginal costs typically were greater than zero. Well, there are a number of a number, a large number of apps and business services that are actually provided where actually the more people that use it, in a sense, the more effective and lower cost it actually becomes. Navigation uh, tools, maps, and so forth are examples of that. Uh, the idea that you had to own employees, if you will, or control them is another area that we're having to challenge ourselves on. Uh, and. And then the notion, too, that you can see your competitors and where they're coming from. And I'd argue the thing that's, that's a bit frightening if you're an incumbent business and, and like ourselves is often your competition doesn't come from people that are in your industry. It comes from another part of the world. And, and, and so, again, one of the things I remember ha having a discussion with the CEO of Nestle talking about the biggest competition for him in many African countries that they operate in is not Unilever or Procter & Gamble or Mars, it's actually Vodafone. Because if someone has an extra, I'm using cents, shillings, whatever you want to use, if I have that extra five cents, the person has a choice between buying a, a candy or getting an app on their phone. It's a, it's, and we never planned it that way. Another example that's not in business but in another world is if you are a leading cardiac surgeon in the United States right now, you probably don't think too much about driverless cars. It's interesting to read in Time magazine and so forth. I would argue you better read about it because 90% of the hearts that are provided uh, for people in heart transplants come from car accident victims, unfortunately. So your supply, if I might say, of hearts is going to potentially be disrupted. And again, that's not typically taught in medical school to be thinking about things like that. So we need to, we need to think cross-sector like in a, in, a, in, a, in a more intensive way. And, and we need to think about how this is going to be applied to everything that we do. This is an example just in the dairy uh, and beef industry, livestock. <coughs> sensors are being put on cows, dairy cows and beef cows. The, the sensors are able to detect uh, changes in the proteins and so forth in blood to know whether a cow is uh, going to be pregnant in a per certain period of time, uh, whether they're at peak milk production cycle or not, whether you should be bringing them back and so forth. So the amount of automation and data that's being created, even in something as basic as you might say as livestock, has escalated. And there's lots of opportunities, business opportunities, productivity, yield opportunities by uh, by applying that uh, to it. One of the, the biggest um, examples of an of a incumbent organization that's had to adapt quickly to this new technology in the Internet of Things is GE. Um, GE, Jeff Email will say, is going through their single biggest transformation, and they've done many, as you know, over, over their uh, periods of time in the last 50 years. And they've decided that they have to become much more of a software house than a world-class manufacturer. And the reason is, and it's when Jeff emailed explained this to me, he said, if you think about a locomotive, and we're very proud at GE about making locomotives. We put a lot of R&D into the, our engine power, into the, you know, the resilience of the wheels and so forth. 
when we actually look at, at the effect of a locomotive on a business, um, the way you do it is by measuring its average speed. And I, this may be a boring thing to just put out here, but the average speed of a locomotive in the U.S. is about 22 miles an hour, that every, every hour for a 24-hour day, and that's kind of how you measure it. If you're able to take that average speed up by one mile per hour, and you happen to be Burlington Northern Railroad, the bottom line improvement impact of that extra one mile an hour is about $250 million. So working on improving the metal and the materials in the wheels or the energy usage in the locomotive will get you some benefit. But if you're GE, you're looking at that and saying, I'm not going to let that $250 million go to an Uber-like group that's out there that's going to use my locomotives to run it better. I'm going to own that disruption. And that's what they're doing, right, is they're saying we have to build the analytics horsepower because we want to capture more than our fair share of that improvement that we're generating. So this is, again, not just for retail and media and consumer, it's for hardcore industry where we see, we see uh, these, these changes. Um, so technology is an area where, as I said, there's a, there's a lot that needs to, we need to look at. All of us are, are being disrupted, and I would include that government. Uh, government needs to think about how we digitize uh, and move things faster. Why does it take six months in Massachusetts to get a driver's license when I can get a passport in 10 hours in Malaysia? So what's, it's, it's digitization that's actually driving it. Why is it in Rwanda it takes six hours only to be able to get a business started up from scratch and it takes about uh, 74 days in New York City? Why, why is that? It's around digitization and, and management and organization around it. The third force is, is the aging population. I mentioned this before. Uh, by 2050, we're going to double the number of people over the age of 65. Um, we are going to have, in, for the first time in human history, more people over the age of 65 than under the age of 14. And we're seeing the impact of this already in places like Japan. Uh, in Korea and also in um, uh, Italy. Uh, and, and people forget this, but one of the biggest sources of productivity growth in the United States uh, from the mid-60s to the mid-70s was women going into the workforce. They, they weren't staying at home. They moved into the workforce. That accounted for half the productivity growth. So productivity growth comes all from labor coming into the market as well as how more effectively you use that labor. If we run these numbers ahead, we're going to see a drag effect of this globally of in the order of uh, two percentage points of GDP growth, right? And now, those countries that are lucky enough to have a young population, and assuming they can educate them for employment, are going to be having a, a, a sort of a tailwind, if you will, as opposed to a a headwind. One of the things that the, I'm involved very much with the Canadian government, but also the U.S. government on growth and productivity, and one thing that the Prime Minister Trudeau and the President Obama worry the most about is this headwind of productivity growth that's coming from an aging population, and that has implications on immigration. The Canadian government's even saying, why, why don't we open the borders to get to 100 million people? Why aren't we allowing way more Mexicans to come in than we ever have before because it's in the benefit. So we, we have to start thinking differently about this. The other comment I just, as I said before, is about 90% of healthcare costs, which by the way, globally are rising at three percentage points above GDP growth, are accumulated in the last two years of a person's life. That's where a lot of the cost comes into the system. So as we get older, we are building up a liability on the, on the health side that we're going to have to deal with. And most government budgets can barely handle what they've got, if, if, if any. I'd, li I'd love to know, maybe Singapore and Hong Kong, but they're more city states. It's, they, we can't afford to, to service, if you will, the aged people we have today, and we're just getting started on that side. So we're going to have to think about this. So when people retire, there is no way we can say that people retire at the age of 65. When that was put in place in the UK, my understanding was that the 
um, the, the average life expectancy was about 65, right? You, it wasn't a very generous program, actually, when you look at it. It was a brilliant program, but not a very generous program. And we've just got old, you know, we're healthier. So we're going to have to rethink that. The other element to it, to me, and I'll come back to this implication, is if we are going to work longer, which I think we will have to, the idea that we just get educated once, or, you know, in K to 12, or maybe once in tertiary school, by the time we're 23, we're done, I think is over. It's going to have to be lifelong learning. I could see us coming back to an institution like this when we're 40, 50, 60, 70, just to be retooled, as well as the online side of things. It's going to have, I think, a lot of changes. The fourth is the uh, interconnectedness of the world. Despite the increasing geopolitical uh, challenges that are going on, we are actually seeing a much more interconnected world than we have ever seen. Uh, and a lot of that, as I said, coming from the data side of it. And we have evidence that those countries that are more connected to the world in terms of trade, uh, capital flows, data, will get higher GDP growth than those that are more isolated. It has a very big impact or multiplier effect on growth. And so thinking about the linkages that we have will be, uh, will be essential. Volatility with this is, is, has gone up. These are the number of what we call three sigma days. This was done actually before we had the first part of uh, January 2016 where we had the biggest drop in, in the global markets in history. We, we, we wiped out seven trillion dollars of value. I think uh, it's now about six trillion. But volatility is here to stay. I would argue with these four forces we're talking about, I think it's going to be a very volatile time for the next 15 to 20 years. And what companies need to do and organizations need to do is to adapt, be flexible, and I'll come on to that in a second. But volatility is going to be part and parcel uh, of what we do. Geopolitics is a big issue. I don't, I, I, this is one of the many areas I should be taking notes from you on. I think how you guys are able to uh, thrive and drive in, a, in a, one of the, I think, most geopolitically tense areas in the world is, is amazing and inspiring. But when you ask now, this, is, this, is, this has changed significantly uh, in the last five years. When I joined McKinsey in 1986, there was a prevailing view in the business community that actually geopolitics didn't matter so much. And it was epitomized when George Soros took on the Bank of England, and I think it was 1992, to have a single entrepreneur hedge fund guy attack a central bank like the Bank of England was just kind of ludicrous. How could and that single person forced the Bank of England to do something it didn't want to do. And so there was this kind of raucous cry that the, you better be careful about the capital markets. You may be a communist, you may be a right-wing guy. If you don't pay attention to the capital markets, you're going to get pounded. So we frankly don't care too much about the geopolitics. And I, I drank that Kool-Aid for probably 15 years. That's over. We need to be very careful and thoughtful about geopolitics and the effect that it has. And we're seeing that with executives all around the world. And I think what people are beginning to realize, even if you're in Ohio and you don't have any global business, you're, you're making butter uh, for consumers in the United States, you better care about geopolitics because it's going to affect commodity prices. It's going to affect what your consumers are doing. It's going to affect your cost of capital. This is something we all need to, to think about. So I hope that's just give, giving you just a quick tour of these uh, four forces that are out there. Any one of them, I think, particularly the first three, would make this next 15 years, I think, a very profound time in human history. The fact that there are four of them all happening at once means I think we're, we're going to be in a unique time in a 500-year time frame. I won't be around in 500 years to you tell me whether I'm right or wrong, but I, I, I just it's more to have that mindset because we're in for some big changes, many more changes than I've seen in my time frame in leadership, and that's what we all need to be prepared for. So what, what does that mean? I think first, if you're a business, one reality you better get used to is that the average lifetime of a company has been shrinking. If you were in the Standard and Poor's 500 uh, in 1935, which I'd argue was not a great year uh, to be on, the, on that uh, index, your average lifetime was 90 years. Uh, today, right, it, it's about 15 years. In 2011, it was 18. So the, so, the, so the life cycle, and these are successful, powerful companies, 
their life cycle has been shrinking. So the, the metabolic rate of the world is going up. I did this very closely because McKinsey's 90th anniversary is now. And so we, if, and, and as I said, we don't take our own medicine. So if we don't change and innovate, we're going to be gone because we have no God-given right uh, to be here unless we, we move. Um, I think the imperatives are really five. I'm just going to, again, for the sake of time, uh, go through them. These, I think, un, in a, in a, fortunately or unfortunately, they all have to be done at once. Um, and the first one I talk about is just innovate. I, and people talk about this all the time. I think the challenge in innovation is how much is sufficient to be able to stay ahead of the curve with the world, consumers moving so quickly and your competitors moving so quickly. And, and my, my rule of thumb, and it varies again by industry, is to be thinking that if you aren't, even if you are a well-established, successful player, if you don't think about 40% of your business three years from now not existing today, in other words, you're going to change 40% of your business in three years, you're way too slow. I would argue in some industries like telecom, banking, uh, manufacturing, that number is higher. Uh, and so the, and the problem is trying to get innovation going in a successful organization is culturally difficult. I, one of the things I've told, saying this, I have a rule, a, a mantra that I've, I visit at least two CEOs a day. I have to. And I, and I did that because when I joined McKinsey, I didn't want to do internal work. I'm not really allowed to do external work because I'm not reliable enough anymore because I have to do <laughs> things in our firm. But my way to keep plugged in is to meet two CEOs or government leaders. And I always ask them, you know, what are the things that you're most excited or worried about? That, that's where some of the trend uh, work came in. And I then also ask them, what do you wish you learned at the beginning of your career that you know now as a CEO what, what on leadership? And I'll come back to that at the, at the very end. But one of the biggest factors is this innovation. And, and one of the first people I talked to was Mike Duke when he was leading Walmart. It was 2010. I was in Bentonville, Arkansas. I said, what are your top three things? He said, you tell me yours first. I said, OK, it's technology. I went through the, he said, my biggest concern right now is technology. Because at Walmart, you know, there, he said, I'm, I'm not trying to sound arrogant. We're recognized as literally one of the best retailers in the world. We know where to put our stores in the right dirt. We know how to negotiate with our suppliers. We, we know data management. We, we're the benchmark. But what I've noticed is that 6% of my sales are now co being competed on on the internet. This was 2010. 40% of the sales that occur in my store, people look at the internet before they come into my store, right? And he said, so I've got to become a technology company. I've got to become a technology company in six to seven years. And I've got an organization that's incredibly proud about being retailers in the old world. And in case you haven't noticed, Dom, I'm in Bentonville. Not many coders want to move to Bentonville to do code and startups. They want to be in California or maybe New York, not here. So how do I change my organization that's successful? And that's one of the biggest challenges that I think organizations are going to face on, the, on, on innovation. But I think, again, this is, again, looking at what is the right amount of innovation that you want to drive. I think that has to come from the top of the organization. And then what do you enable? And that has to come from the bottom of the organization. Uh, digitizing, we've talked about that. The digitization element is, again, for everyone. Uh, about two years ago, 5% of, I would argue, all organizations were being disrupted by digitization. If you look at it today, it's 25%. So it's gone from 5 to 25%. I, I won't bore you with the details of how we come up with that number, but that's the scale of the change. And it's not just how you deal with the consumer, it's how you digitize your processes and how, and how that works. So what we're finding now is a new CXO role that never existed before, but we think will have to be in all organizations is the chief digital officer. The first CFO came into existence in 1962, at least based on our research. It was a California technology company. I'd argue if you saw any company that, that, that didn't have a CFO in it, you'd kind of say, what's going on? Is there a problem? I think that's going to be the case with the chief digital officer. That's different than the CIO. These are the people that manage your data assets, which are, are important. Organizing for the future. 
the, the, what I'm noticing and seeing in the organizations that, that we work with around the world, and this is in the last two years, is a flattening of organizations. Most organizations, especially if they've been long and established, are taking anywhere from four to six layers out of the organization. Stuart Gulliver at HSBC, who's, I think, done some of the most radical cost restructuring of any bank CEO, is on round two of, de of, of delayering and what he's doing. And it's not about cost. That, that's a part of it. It's also about speed. It's enabling people in a flatter organization to make more decisions and have more accountability to be able to, to drive things. Old assumptions about how many direct reports you have are being challenged. The Inditex CEO, which is the leading retailer today, has more than 100 direct reports. I, I still don't know how he actually manages to run an organization with that many reports, but it certainly involves a lot more data and <laughs> accountability being spread out. Um, the only other comment I'm going to make is on reallocating resources. We have found that those organizations that succeed over a time of disruption are those that reallocate their capital and people in a manner that is in the order of 10 to 12 percent a year. Most companies, and governments in particular, look at last year's budget and adjust it by a couple of percentage points. That's what McKinsey does. We, we, we don't, and the reason why it's, we do that is because it's very difficult to take capital and people away from a business unit. I, I've never in my 30 years in McKinsey ever seen a business unit come forward and say, you know what, I'd like less people and less capital this year and he, take it. It just doesn't happen. We're all optimistic and we want to grow it. The challenge is organizations need to be much better at reallocating significant parts of capital and people. That's nimbleness. If you're a startup, and we're working with a lot of startups now, particularly in California and China, they reallocate on an eight-week eight week basis. Eight weeks is their t cycle time. They don't like one-year plans uh, and where they move it. So this is going to have some pretty significant Im implications on how we work and how we manage organizations uh, over time. I think there's going to be implications for uh, emerging markets. I just put here, and I think, I think these relate to Pakistan. You'll have to tell me if I, where I'm off base. I think vocational education is just way underappreciated. It is fundamental to helping provide education for employment, and it's one of the biggest gaps. One of, one of my biggest worries about China is we actually have too many universities. Too many people want to go to university and not to the vocational uh, schools that are actually needed. The notion about thinking about pivotal industries, uh, and this is where, again, if I think about growth opportunities, and there are many in this country uh, that, that you're already doing a lot of things are, but just some of the ones I've seen in software, ag food, which often is not seen as a popular or exciting area. These are big opportunities uh, for people to be able to do it. The power, infrastructure, uh, and so forth. But we found that those uh, countries, and I'd say South Korea is a role model of that through the, through the late 60s and the 70s, focusing and then driving the education, the policy, and everything around it to, to, to provide the flywheel for other areas is, is critical. Uh, next generation technology, there is, I think, actually digitization, particularly in government, will lead to even faster productivity and economic growth in this country. Digitizing actually is one of the biggest drivers of getting rid of corruption. Uh, it's one of the ways in which you can speed up approval processes uh, as you move through the system and it provides more uh, clarity. So this is an area, I think Rwanda to me is a role model in taking uh, this on. One stop shop for FDI. The, I think the Singaporeans do this the best. They, they're Economic Development Board is like a Procter and Gamble for capital. I, I happen to be a member of it. What these people, they don't pay you to be a member of this thing, but what they do is they will call you, and I was in London often, I get a call saying, we need you next week to organize a dinner with the following seven industrialists, and we want to talk about Singapore and why they're not spending time. It's literally like, now don't say it to them that way, please be a little more polite, but that's what we want to do, you do it. So they have a group of, you know, 20 people that act in a way as their salesman, if I could call it that, for trying to attract people and then how, the, how they move it forward. A very 
aggressive, segmented approach to try to get foreign direct investment uh, in, in the country. Ease of doing business is absolutely fundamental. I mentioned this, the, again, how long does it take to start up a business? What's, it's cutting through the, the red tape uh, and moving things. And then this notion of thinking regionally, not just in your, your uh, particular neck of the woods, but what's the role in the broader, with this, glo this global force of the 2.2 billion, what, what do you want to do on that front? The last page is just on leadership, and I probably should have spent most of the time on this one. But what, what I want to say is I, I mentioned that I talk to these two CEOs or government leaders a day, and I ask them, one of the second question I typically ask is, what do you wish you learned uh, that you know now for the beginning of your time as a leader? And what I've found, just to cut to the chase, is that it's rare that the comment is on something like what I should have done. I should have, I bought a company that I didn't value properly, or I should have changed the compensation system to move it. Th those are all, th those are important things, or I should have relayered my organization. Those are important what's, that, those are there. The, by far the most common uh, comment was around character, character of leaders, who the, who the leader is. And I just want to give a couple of examples of it this resilience. J Jeff Emelt, who we, we were talking about him the, the other day, I asked him, it was saying it was 2010 after the financial crisis, GE is a leadership factory, but like other organizations, Citi has been a leadership factory for many organizations around the world. I said, after the financial crisis, what have you learned about leadership that you wish you knew at the beginning? And he said to me, you know, we have some phenomenal business leaders that we create. Many of them go on and run other companies. They've turned around businesses, they've built businesses, you know, they've dealt in multi multicultural environments. We, we put them through all sorts of things before they even get to the level of being on the executive committee. But he said, during the financial crisis, two of my people cracked like glass. When the temperature went up to 1400 degrees, they, they were paralyzed. And if you recall, GE was literally on a thread having to get their financing from the Federal Reserve to fund their commercial paper. I mean, they were literally on the brink. And two very seasoned uh, senior executives were paralyzed, just literally paralyzed, like literally had to shake them because they were catatonic in what was happening. And he said, he said, Dom, the problem is you can't turn people up to 1400 degrees and test whether they can do it. It's, you're gonna find out when things really hit the fan. So I said, that's interesting. So what do you do about it? He said, well, what, what I'm doing about it now is I invite my executives to stay over at my house at least for a couple of nights each year. And I said, so your solution's a sleepover. Is that, is that your model? Is that, and he goes, well, it, what I'm trying to get at is you, what you need to do is really understand the character of the, of the person, how they informally act versus how they formally act. And I realized that all of our interactions are really around business plans, driving better performance, numbers, put not as much around the individual. He goes, it's amazing how little we actually knew about each other as humans, right? And, where, and what's driven us and what our parents did or didn't do to us when we were growing up and so forth. And so I'm just saying this resilience is, a, is, is critical. And the ability to be able to deal with setbacks that will happen, and we're going to see a lot more setbacks uh, in the next 15 to 20 years than we have before. How do you deal with that and get back up on your feet? One, I, I'm going to spend a bit of time on this because I think we don't spend enough time. We think about growth and you know, innovation, and that's all important. Organizations are going to have to think much more about their shock absorption capability. Uh, the chairman of Samsung took me to the tool shed many times when I was in Korea to teach me stuff. Like I would do something and he'd say, you come over here, you'd get the translator. And one of the things I remember he taught me, we were doing risk analysis. It was, at, it was in 2001. Samsung also went to the brink in the Asian financial crisis. They borrowed in US dollars, floating rates. You know, they, they didn't have a CFO. Um, and and, and he, we were doing a risk analysis, and we had tons of documents and charts. And he took me, I remember, into a side room, patted me on the head, and he said, I don't like looking at lots of numbers. The way I like to look at it is, are we a seven torpedo company or not? And I said, is this something to do with North Korea or am I not trying to, and he goes, no. Risks don't come in nice, you know, sequences. Like you get hit by a operational issue or a financial, he goes, they clump. 
So a operational crisis or risk becomes a financial one, which becomes a reputational one, which becomes a people one. And the problem is they, they all come flying in at once. And so it's how we organize ourselves to handle all this stuff without cratering. That's what we need to focus on. Uh, and so resilience, I just want to emphasize, is, is, uh, is critical. Selflessness and broad-mindedness. There are, you, I, one, of the, one of the areas, you look at succession planning, and I just want to give one example. In the US, there was a guy running Clorox, and I asked him this question, as I said before, and I said, what have you learned? He goes, I've learned now that it's better to be almost Buddhist-like. Don't do something that's good for someone, even without ever expecting to get something back. Because if you do that, good things will happen. If you do it expecting something to happen, it won't. So just be, and I said, well, where did you learn that? Or why do you think that way? And he said, well, we were thinking about succession. And I spent a lot of time with the, with actually the US Army, because when you become a five-star general, that's a pretty big decision, right? So he said, I went to them with my notebook saying, because there's, there's actually a HR person and others involved. And he said, I went with my notebook for a three hour session. He goes, it was 15 minutes long. And I said, well, what did you learn? And he said, he said, at the end of the day, we look at two things. One is judgment, and we can see whether if someone's got judgment or not. And the second is selflessness. Are they selfless? And it's just interesting, and again, in different environments, how people, and you can see it. Do people use the word I or we and so forth? So there's a lot, I think, around the character of what who leaders are and how they operate that is, is fundamental to it. The other one, just, you know, two last ones, telescope and microscope. I learned this actually from Jim Flaherty, who was the Minister of Finance in Canada during the crisis uh, period. And he said, I wished I had learned at the beginning to be able to put a microscope in one eye and a telescope in the other and not get a headache. Now, I've never done that, and I don't think he ever did that. But the whole concept of being short and long I think is a very interesting model. And he said, I had to always think about we could, we could be in serious trouble in a two-day period, but I'm also responsible for the economic growth of a country over a 10-year period, and I need to be doing both. Most leaders are good at doing one or the other, not both, and you need to develop both, uh, both muscles. And the final one is I'd say that this chief people officer. I think it, this is where I go to the education. It's my strong view that, and this is what we found again from countless of the CEO uh, discussions that we've had, is that he or she who has the best talent is gonna win because it's very difficult to be able to predict. You say, well, that's obvious, but it's very difficult to predict what's gonna happen in terms of a strategy because the world's moving so fast. But what you can control is the leaders that you actually have with you and how you work with them and help them. We do a retired CEO conference. We do it every three years. And the people that go have to have not been a CEO for five years. So there's a bit of distance. They're not trying to justify what they did or didn't do. And we ask them, what would you do over again if you could be the CEO again? Always, in every case, I don't care which country you pick, the top three are people. I would have moved people out faster. I took too long. It's difficult removing someone, especially if that someone's helped you in doing what you've wanted to do, but they may no longer be relevant for what needs to happen. I would have promoted younger people much faster, give people more rope earlier to, to move on, very young people, give them the room to be able to, to move ahead. And the third is I would have spent more time in the coaching and interaction with people, because that's really where you get the performance and understanding where they are. And so this notion on human development uh, being absolutely critical, even in a high-tech world that we're moving in, is, is critical. I hope I've given you a bit of a picture of some fundamental forces that are underway. I think they're going to apply to all of us in some significant, we're going to have to think boldly and very differently on some of the very basic assumptions. And it's going to mean quite a bit of difference in terms of leadership. We spend too much time talking about what leaders do versus who they are, and I think who you are is a muscle that can be built uh, over time. Thank you for listening.